Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session talking about insights on re-architecturing to a single code base. My name is Erez. I'm working in Ogori for the past four years. I'm a fir firmware embedded engineer. My name is Zayn. I'm also a firmware engineer at Ogori for the last two years. So what is Ogori? Ogori providing predictive health, uh, predictive health maintenance for a, a predictive maintenance solution for a, a, a clients that has critical equipment that need to be monitored. So what we basically do, we place sensors over machines uh, with different kind of sensors uh, uh, implemented in them. We, we sample uh, and send the data using Bluetooth to a local gateway and to our cloud, for, to our cloud platform. So basically, we monitor, we diagnose, we guide the owners of the uh, machines what should do with it. Uh, hopefully, they should act accordingly and repair or do whatever action is necessary. So today, we're going to talk about single code base. Uh, and we'll explain what it means, at least for us. And then we're going to talk about why Zephyr is a good fit for a single code base uh, uh, concept. And uh, afterwards, we're going to speak about migrating to Zephyr whether you have different kind of a code base or software stack and you have to make it to Zephyr, we're going to explain how it's done. And afterwards, we're going to proceed to talk about a single code base design rules. <coughs> so this was our starting point. We had a legacy device on the right side that was developed a few years ago over a very old Nordic SDK. It was based on Nordic chip. It was developed on very old Nordic uh, SDK, supported up to BLE 4.2, and it was unupdatable for us, uh, and that particular uh, aspect. Uh, and a few years later, we developed uh, the new generation uh, uh, device. Uh, we chose Zephyr Autos for that. Uh, and of course, we use the latest uh, uh, NCS. We keep on updating that. Uh, and Basically, we created a situation that we have two different devices, but that doing more or less the same functionality, but have two different code bases, entirely different code bases. Uh, and we, did, we didn't like this uh, situation. We wanted to create one single code base for all our hardware devices um, that can be used for us to add more features and uh, uh, maintain these devices in a better way with one single code base. Uh, and this is why we chose Zephyr for that, because Zephyr uh, emphasizes uh, uh, hardware abstraction and modularity in a very nice way. And these are, uh, uh, these are important uh, uh, features for a single code base application that runs on multiple hardware, because we want the ability to compile to different kind of boards uh, and, and, get, uh, and, and use the same application for that. And also modularity is very important because you want to exclude and include features. It depends on what board you're using. And here's an example of application layer on the top. Uh, and below that, uh, be below the Zephyr abstraction, we can see uh, two different hardwares. The applications use, application needs accelerometer, sensor, needs magnometer, it needs thermometer, and it uses a flash. But in these two boards, the sensors are different, it's different accelerometer and so on. And also the flash is different, but the application is exactly the same. Uh, another reason to choose Zephyr for a single code based application is that a lot of features are already built in, uh, in the Nordic Connect SDK and Zephyr. For example, we uh, adopted the usage of NCU boot that's provide us a secure boot mechanism uh, uh, we also use a file system, we chose LittleFS, but Zephyr is offer more than one uh, choice of file system. And we also use Memfold, which is a very a powerful debugging tool. They're all, also here representing in the, in the exhibition. Uh, Simsys DSP, compression libraries, and many other features that are already <coughs> built in in Zephyr. <coughs> so when you design or thinking about single code based application, uh, you, ne you need to attend to a lot of issues. For example, are your devices that you want to uh, change their code base already deployed in the field? And if yes, will you be able to, uh, to update them over the air from one code base to another code base? 
uh, will they will be backwards compatible? Means after the update, will they will behave the, the same in your IoT stack? Uh, will they perform well in terms of memory and performance? Perhaps there are older devices that has lower capabilities and the uh, performance will not be suitable for the new application that implemented on it. And of course, how will the boot mechanism look like in this case? So, in order to proceed on that, we came up with a strategic plan. We decided to tackle first the major risks and make sure that we can achieve that. And only, that by, and only then continue development, the, uh, the single code base application, and then deploy it. And the first risk or the first milestone that we marked for ourselves was over the update. Will we be able to, uh, to update the devices that are already deployed on the field from the older code base to the new code base? So let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, our, our old legacy devices software stack look like that. It's, remember, it's a legacy, it's a, it's a very old uh, SDK uh, uh, from Nordic. So it launches from address zero uh, to the bootloader and then launches the, uh, our application, which is the Oguri app. Uh, in this case, we used our own bootloader and not the SDK bootloader, but it doesn't matter uh, too much. So this was the old software stack. Uh, this was the new software stack, Zephyr based, launched from MCU boot, and then we have the MCU boot secondary and primary uh, for the application. So what we basically needed to do is to shift from old software stack to a new software stack. Well, is that possible? Well, it is. Uh, we have, we know that our application has access to the entire internal flash. And we know that we are able to disable and enable the bootloader as we want. And immediately we're going to see, in a minute we're going to see how we use these two uh, facts in order to accomplish the migration to Zephyr. So what we see here is the internal MCU uh, uh, flash, software stack. And on the side we see external flash. And let's try to follow up. So first, we perform regular firmware update for the Ogre application. We, mag we, we update it to Ogre application 2.0. Once we do that, this new application now has migration capabilities and can help us in the transition. So we pass along from the platform to the local gateway, to the MCU, to the external flash, three artifacts. One of them is the new version of the bootloader. The other one is the MCU boot. And the last one is the Zephyr app. And these last two are the uh, artifacts that you actually want to migrate to. So once they are safely stored in the external flash, we disable the bootloader. Remember, we can do that. And the application also can erase it and then copy the bootloader that we stored before to the same location. Now, the bootloader 2.0 also has migration capabilities, and it will also participate in this game in a minute. Now, once it's copied to the internal flash, we can re-enable it and boot. Now we're running the bootloader. Once the bootloader is running and takes control, it scratches, it scratches the entire internal flash, uh, uh, except from the MBR, and copy MCU boot, copy Zephyr application. And once they are there, we can disable the bootloader. We don't need it anymore at that point because once we boot, we boot from the MBR and because the bootloader is disabled, we're gonna jump to address 1000 and then to uh, the MCU boot, which takes control from that point on. So what we did is successfully migrated from old software stack to new software stack over the air using BLE only without flash, flashing or something similar like that. And we've proven it's possible to do it over the air and we can continue on developing our project, which is a single code base for the entire install base. Uh, I'll let Ziv continue from here, the second part of the okay, th Thank session. you, Elvis. So now we're going to build in the application and strategy is the same, risk first. And the first uncertainty we had is with size. And the reason we had that uncertainty is that our uh, 
and new devices have uh, 266 uh, five, kilobytes of RAM. And when they built our Zephyr based application, they got to uh, 160 kilobytes of uh, RAM footprint. Our legacy device has only 64 kilobytes of RAM. So there was a serious question, can we squeeze it? And to answer this question, we took our uh, uh, Zephyr based application, we gave it a very serious diet, we left only the uh, communication protocol, we built it on the legacy devices, and it built, it was the first milestone, and it also worked with the BLA communication. And at that point, gradually, we added uh, more devices, more uh, drivers, and more modules uh, to achieve a complete uh, a full application. While doing so, we used on size reduction. We removed unused config. We optimized stack allocation. <laughs> uh, we shared the work queue instead of having several work queue, if, if it was possible in our case. <laughs> and we used the mempool. Uh, Zephyr allows <laughs> to have a statically allocated memory managed like a heap, meaning you can allocate and uh, free uh, dynamically while the application is running from that statically allocated memory, and we use that. And we used it to save uh, a memory. We had a static uh, allocated pool, and at one state of the program, program application that needs uh, buffers, like sampling and streaming to flash, we uh, allocate from this pool and once this stage is over, we freed it. Next stage was to transmit the data via BLE. Again, we needed buffer from this. From the same pool, we uh, allocate these buffers and uh, free them one, once uh, the procedure was over. So by that, we save having uh, all the buffers uh, stuck all together. Uh, keep in mind, when uh, doing some stack optimization, <laughs> There may be a case, maybe not right when you do it, but maybe later uh, uh, along the way, that you have some stack overflows. Uh, it can happen, and just keep in mind, if it happens, go first to the uh, stack optimization, because maybe it's there. Uh, Zephyr gives us a stack sentinel, which is a, a, a tool that the checks helps to, to check for a stack overflow. The way it works, it has like some magic number, uh, on the address of each thread, and every time there is some context switching or some other operation on the thread, uh, it checks this value, and if there is uh, some problem, some corruption, it will give an alert. The minus of this <laughs> is that if the corruption jumped this uh, number, then you will not get an alert, and also it will not give you an alert exactly when the uh, overflow happened. It will give you an alert only when it checks this value, which, which means when there is some operation uh, between the threads. There are also a uh, hardware stack protection and, and MPU stack card. Uh, we use the, the stack sentinel uh, because actually it, uh, it, is, it has less footprint than the other two. Um, so at that point we have a, an application that compiled, full application, and the next uncertainty was uh, functionality. <laughs> Our sensors uh, sample at a higher rate and uh, they stream this, all the samples to, to Flash. Uh, so it, the, it needs to achieve, uh, to, to write to Flash fast enough. And the reason it was an uncertainty, our new device has a NAND external Flash, which can write uh, two kilobytes per one page write operation. And it writes faster than our no Flash uh, device that we have on our legacy device, which can only write 256 kilobytes, uh, bytes per page write operation, meaning eight times more uh, operations requiring CPU intervention for streaming the same amount of data. And again, that was a big uh, uh, question mark. So uh, we flashed the, the program and we send the command for the endpoint to sample and crossed our fingers and it didn't work. <laughs> and uh, we had to, we didn't give up. We move to uh, seeing what we can uh, do to optimize the procedure. Uh, our program, already, our application already used PPIs and, and DMA, and if your hardware allows it, uh, you should use it. It saves on CPU. But what we did is uh, we used the profiling with a picoscope, uh, with some GPU toggling at, at some functions. <laughs> and what we see here, uh, the blue line <laughs> is the sensor interrupt whenever there is a sample ready. The yellowish line 
is the thread that manages the writing to flash operation. And the red line is a thread, uh, is the high priority thread. And it takes, you see here, like four and a half milliseconds, which is quite a lot. And what it basically does, whenever the, the driver uh, collects samples, and when it gets some certain chunk of samples, it calls on the callback for the application. Now, this driver, we use it, we run it in a high priority thread because the accuracy of the rate is important for us. And in the same thread, it calls for this uh, application callback. And this application callback, basically, its job is to take the samples and give it to the thread of the flash streamer to, uh, not to the thread, but give it to the buffer of the, of the flash streamer to put it to flash. But what it does, this thread, this callback, it calls on the a normal Zephyr API, which is sensor fetch and sensor get for each sample individually. So there is a lot of sample fetch, sample get. Uh, and what we sought to do to avoid this is to change the callback API, uh, the, the Zephyr normal API, <laughs> um, to give us the buffer, the, the pointer to the buffer of the chunks, and not use the sample fetch, sample get uh, operations. And um, basically, it's, it's all there. I'm not going to go into details. You can see it in the presentation later. But this is like the, the arrow show the, the sensor, the, the Zephyr uh, uh, generic code that we know, and uh, the changes that we, we made to it. We, we created like our own uh, sensor H module uh, header, sorry. Uh, and by that, we were able to reduce the, the time of this, of this uh, thread from four and a half milliseconds to 220 microseconds. And it enabled us to, uh, to achieve the functionality that we wanted. Uh, we can actually see that, that it was not the, the flash that is writing uh, slow that, uh, that uh, did not let us do the, the functionality, but the way we used the, uh, the function, the thread was too long. So the flash operations did not happen every time the flash was uh, available. Okay, so second uncertainty was removed, and at that point we were all very happy. We were confident that we will have this uh, single code base on the way, and we moved from the red light to green and yellow. Um, we'll talk a little bit about design because this is not just like uh, we did to make it work. Uh, when building a, an application that should uh, support several hardwares, you want that each build will contain only what it needs. You, need, you want to avoid having uh, some modules <laughs> that are related to uh, other uh, um, uh, boards that you compile only part of them using if defs and stuff like this. So in a general note, uh, avoid filling the code with if defs, if when possible, aim for exclusion of models from CMIC, uh, module segregation and encapsulation. Uh, and also use the device tree uh, for distinguishing data uh, and some examples for using the device tree to get some uh, generity <laughs> in the application. So here is the example. We have two device tree. Uh, one with, we see the, the, the drivers of the, of the sensor implementation, <laughs> sensor three and sensor one, different sensors. Uh, but we use LSS. They are both vibration sensors. Uh, in that case, it was possible to do this aliasing. Uh, in, the, in the application, we will use this macro DT alias with the VIP sensor, and the application doesn't care from, the, the, from, which, from which device it is or which sensor it is. It will know how to bind it. Also, we can use the information like uh, if it's, for example, flash, we can use the page size and block size, put it in the device tree, and by that we will not have to configure it uh, specifically for each uh, a board or, or target or have separate models for different flash, you can use uh, just draw this data from the device tree and that I'd have more uh, generic application. And I'm going to talk about, show an example now uh, of how we sometimes need or want to expand an API to have uh, more generity. And this example is the BIST. BIST is a built-in self-test. It's a mechanism that we have that whenever the, our device has powered up, uh, they go over all the components in the, in the board and check if they function as they should. Uh, so the, we have a BIST module manager, and for each possible uh, driver that we have on all of the uh, boards that we have, 
we have a module that uh, uses Zephyr API. If it's again sensor fetch, sensor uh, sample get, trigger set, and all these APIs, or if it's a flash, write to flash, rest to flash, see that it is, see that you read it right. So these models uh, use this, this app models in the application uh, use this API to talk with the drivers, uh, which are in the driver area. And the code basically looks something like this. We have a, a BIS directory with all the modules for all the possible drivers, again, uh, that all our hardware uh, have. And we have a lot of if defs in the, in the code, also in the, in the include section and also in the, in the function itself. And we didn't like it so much. And we thought, how can we, sorry, how can we create a agnosticity to hardware in the application? And the way we thought to do it in, in that case, in the BIST case, is that we said, okay, maybe the driver will implement their own BIST. But then how will we call on this BIST without using the normal API? Okay, maybe we need to uh, expand the API. And we'll see in a minute how we did it. Another thing is how do we bind to the driver? Again, we want a way to bind to different drivers. They are not all uh, vibration sensors. They are different sensors and flash and stuff. So we need to bind without knowing. So first things first. Uh, this is how Zephyr, Zephyr currently, without any changes of our, uh, implements the drivers. It's just a, an, a, the API, it's just a reminder. So we have a sensor H model. We have a sensor driver API with all its functions. And here is an example for a sensor channel get uh, function and how it's implemented. And then in the, <laughs> oh, sorry, in the uh, driver uh, module, we will have the, the sensor driver API struct and we will give it to the initializer and this is how it is normally work. What we did, we create like a wrapper, another module uh, that we call it my device for this example. And we include it also in the CMEX. And in this uh, uh, module, we build our own uh, API. We traps the, the Zephyr API <laughs> with a union this union will, uh, will have the, the types of, uh, of drivers that we know if we want, if it's a sensor or flash or, or some other drivers, and also the BIST run. Now, important note is if we implement it like this, uh, we want to stay aligned with, with, with the Zephyr functionality of, 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 of each driver. Uh, this union must be the first uh, element in the struct because the pointer uh, points to that element. And once we in the application, if you use a sensor channel get, for example, we, we give it a pointer to the device. And in, in the implementation, we can see it explicitly uh, cast to this uh, type. So it must be the first uh, argument. And after uh, that, um, we include it. This is my BIST implementation. This is in the, again, in the driver model, instead of having my uh, sensor, uh, uh, sensor device uh, API, we have, we have my device API, and we implemented uh, the BIST uh, function, and uh, we put it to the initializer as the uh, device API, driver API. So th this was the, the first section. The second section is how do we bind without knowing? So we, had a, a, we decided to, do a, to add a BIST um, property to the, uh, to the driver, to each driver that implements uh, a BIST. It's a Boolean, so if it's in the device tree, it's, uh, it's true. Uh, we added, again, to, device, to, to drivers that implement the BIST. And Macrobotics is always fun. Basically, what, what this macro does, this macro is in the application layer. It's in the BIST uh, module. And what this uh, uh, macro does, it goes over uh, all the nodes in the device tree. Each node that have a status OK and a, a BIST uh, property set to true is uh, <laughs> inserted into this uh, array of uh, device pointers. And so in the application, we can use uh, this, uh, this array. And again, not knowing uh, anything about the pointers there, but instead of having all this uh, um, models here that, uh, that we don't need anymore, that I remind you was for all possible drivers. And instead of having uh, all the if-defs, we have much cleaner code 
which is only uh, an array, a, a, a loop going over the, uh, the array with our new uh, MyBistran API, and that's it. So uh, we wrote a blog. I wrote a blog about this uh, this topic, this uh, single code base uh, construction. And there's some personal load uh, also, and most of the data you, you, you heard here. And you are welcome to, to enter and comment, and I will respond. Uh, and I want to thank all the image big photo contributors. And there are some in the, in the presentation. And thank you for your interest and uh, listening. And we are open for questions. Thank you. OK. Ah, sorry. Yes. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned that your sampling uh, for flat, and, and your sampling pretty fast. So probably you must be using some kind of really special flash, because um, the ones we found usually take something like 100,000 bytes per second. Uh. Uh, we use a uh, really, uh, I don't know if it's really large, it's a uh, ma manner of perspective, but I think it's a uh, 16, uh, 16 megabytes. Yeah, uh, this is the size of the flash. And you haven't had any breakdowns, like flash. Uh, they endure. Not after we did the, improv the <laughs> improvement. <laughs> Okay, so if there's no more questions, thank you.